Hi guys and ladies, welcome to another video. Today we have an early impression of a classic men's fragrance that uh, I have to say I was absolutely stunned when I realized there are zero reviews of this on YouTube. Not just reviews, but there are zero first impressions. There's nothing. There is no reviews of this fragrance at all. And uh, this was sent to me out of the generosity of one of the uh, Fragcom, uh, you know, fragrance. Uh, he, he's a splitter. He's someone that, um, you know, he um, sells decants. He's on base notes. He's been on base notes for it, probably, it feels like he's been on base notes since for 50 or 100 years. Uh, um, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. He has that in the reputation of him. If you go look at his ratings and feedback, it's absolutely phenomenal. He's one of the, one of the, you know, you can count the people that you would really recommend highly and, and trustworthy on one hand, and he's one of those people. His name is Mudasir, uh, and Mudasir sent me, I, I did a haul that from Mudasir that I unboxed a week or so ago, and he sent me some samples, and one of them was this. This is a fragrance called Monsieur Lanvin. So the house of Lanvin is a house that's been around for, I think it's like the third or fourth oldest uh, fragrance house in Paris, but it doesn't get very much talk. In fact, when I looked this fragrance up, the only thing that came up, uh, the closest masculine Lanvin fragrance that came up, was Sebastian complaining that they discontinued avant-garde from 2010 or something, you know. Uh, that, that fragrance came out. This fragrance, Monsieur Lambon, came out in 1963. So think about the competition that it had in 1960, in the 1960s. It was competing with fragrances like Abbey Rouge. It was competing with fragrances like this. And there is some similarity, actually. Canon Cologne from 1966, this fragrance is from. There is some similarities. Um, and if you know Abbey Rouge, you know it's a little bit powdery. Monsieur Lanvin is a little bit powdery as well. But I was just absolutely floored that... Um, there's nothing on it from, uh, uh, you know, this happened with uh, Rich Mitch and I. We were looking through a, um, we were looking through YouTube for one of our favorite fragrances. Definitely my favorite Calvin Klein. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think it's his favorite Calvin Klein as well. And that's Calvin by Calvin Klein. And a year ago, before I had a channel, and Rich Mitch was the only one who had a channel at that time, I said, Rich, there's no reviews on Calvin by Calvin Klein. Zero. You would be the YouTube exclusive review. So I guess this is technically like a YouTube exclusive on Monsieur Lanvin, which is absolutely shocking to me. Although I do feel a little bit blessed and honored to be able to do to, to you know be the only one that will be talking about this fragrance. And it's thanks to Mood to Seer. So this is obviously a rare fragrance. It was discontinued. I think 20 or 30 years ago, but it came out in the 1960s. Let me read you the note breakdown and then we'll talk a little bit about what I got out of it. Today's the first day I've given it a full wear. I did wear it to bed um, once before, so you can see I have put a pretty good dent in the decant, although he, with the decant that he sent me was not completely full, but still, he, he gave me a very generous amount. So the note breakdown is bergamot. There's some fruity aspects, but the fruity aspects are minimal to me. It's there to add depth. You're not going to smell this and go, oh, raspberry, like, you know, Tom Ford's Tuscan leather. No, the fruity elements are just there to add depth. There's some green leafy elements. There's sage and lemon. Now, in the 60s, you have to remember, there was another huge hit that came out, and that's Eau Sauvage, EDT. And this is an Edmund Rudnitska. Um, I never got on with Eau Sauvage. I always preferred Eau de Hermes. This just wasn't, this is too clean cut, like my haircut. This is too clean cut for me. I like a little bit of dirtiness in my fragrances. This is outside of Abbey Rouge. Abbey Rouge is my favorite fragrance from the 1960s, hands down. 
but outside of Abbey Rouge, this might have just leapt to the top. I would love to have a bottle of this stuff. The heart is carnation, geranium, jasmine, rose, sandalwood, cedar, and cinnamon. The base is oak moss, and you definitely get the old school oak moss here. If you watched my labdanum um, video from yesterday, you know that this was one of the ones that made the list. There is labdanum in the base. There's leather. There's musk, and we'll get back to that musk later. There's myrrh, there's tonka, there's vanilla, and there's civet. And that civet adds that dirtiness that I crave. It adds that complexity, it adds that depth. This is a fantastic gentleman's fragrance. You know, you're talking the 1960s. Men didn't wear perfume back then, you know what I mean? It was looked down upon for a man to wear perfume. That was a woman's thing. Uh, and... Let me tell you a little bit about the fragrance, and then, by the way, I, afterwards I have a surprise unboxing for all you unboxing fiends out there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the fragrance. So it starts off a little bit pissy, green, citruses, and you get a big dose of musk right out of the gate. And that musk, if you are familiar with old school musky fragrances, there's one fragrance that instantly reminded me of this fragrance of um, Monsieur Lambon that I own in my collection, but I think the fragrance I own is inferior to Monsieur Lambon. I think Monsieur Lambon is a superior fragrance to this. This is Paul Sebastian Fine Cologne. Now, I'm not saying that this is a bad fragrance. I'm saying that the musk, I'm saying that um, this. Okay, I was expecting this to be this when I bought it. Okay, what is wrong with this fragrance to my nose is the musk is turned up too loud, which can definitely happen if you're not careful with musk. And there's a big giant floral ylang ylang note, I believe. I believe it's ylang. Some sort of yellow floral, maybe Narcissus, I don't know, Narcissus ylang ylang. I don't have the note tree here, but... There's some sort of giant floral with musk in Paul Sebastian Fine Cologne. And it does leave a distinct impression, but I don't enjoy wearing it. I never had that feeling today with Monsieur Lambon. I have a seven hour dry down on my left hand. And I have a uh, 15 minutes ago, I just did a fresh spray. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's stunning. And you know what else is stunning is the fact that no one talks about this. I would take this, if I had to go old school, I would take this over Chanel's Pour Monsieur, hands down. I was expecting this to be Chanel, Chanel's Pour Monsieur, actually. I don't like the EDT of Chanel Pour, of Chanel Pour Monsieur. It's, it's, people say it's classy, it's this, it's that, and it, and it might be, but it's, it's not for me. Um, I keep it as a reference. It's like a museum piece for me. I very rarely wear it. Same with Eau Sauvage. Um, probably, the, probably the closest impression I could give is if you took these two and you combine them together and you added a little bit of that dirty civet, but the opening is very 60s, 70s masculine. You get a big hit of that herbal you know, uh, sage. The geranium almost can add a little bit of undertone of soapy, clean, citrusy quality. The lemon and bergamot give that citrusy quality. I love the old school carnation. I love the composition. It's a masterful composition. Uh, this is done very well. And this is why, you know, I tell people all the time, if you're going to understand the fragrance game and, and the progression you know, it's almost like studying history. You have to know how we got here before you can really understand where we're going to go in the future. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you did, if you don't know the events of World War One, World War Two, the Civil War for Americans, or whatever it may be, you know, if you don't understand what has transpired previously, it's hard to um, put things in their proper place. It's hard to give something the right piece of your mind. You know or to really understand where someone is coming from. And so this fragrance is a perfect example of that because 
Today, this fragrance is a niche fragrance. This fragrance is a $300, $400 niche fragrance. They put it in a fancy bottle and on it goes. But this is why I love vintage because if I go look up the newest Zerzhov release or Bodicea, the Victorious, or whatever that insane house is that has like 500 releases a year, and you go to YouTube and you look something up, and you'll realize that there's 50 influencers trying to put their video out first or whatever it is on this garbage fragrance that, you know, the bottle it's in is better than the fragrance itself kind of thing. And then there's this. And there's nobody willing to put up a review or talk about Monsieur Lambon. No one. Zero. No one even thought about it. Uh, and this came out in 1963, so it's not like they haven't had time. They've had time to decide what this is and what this isn't. There have to be vintage lovers out of, like me out there who would go on the internet. I got this, and, and I went on the internet and searched it, and I was shocked there was nothing. Dumbfounded. That's like saying there's no reviews of Eau Sauvage. You know, these were direct competitors. These Chanel, Pour Monsieur, and this were direct competitors. And so the fact that nobody put anything up, it just shocks me. Um, but let's get back to the fragrance. So you really start to get that musk. I would say in the opening, it's dominated by the citruses, the aromatic feeling sage with the touches of the green notes and the fruity notes. This is a very classy fragrance. I would have no problem wearing this to the office. Even though I mentioned there's civet, it's done in a classy way. This is class all the way. And if I had a suit on, you would smell absolutely amazing. There is one other fragrance actually that gives me a slight, let me just stand up and grab this. There is one other fragrance that gives me a slight um, inkling, you know, a slight, you'll, you'll be reminded of it and that's Chaps. Chaps by Ralph Lauren reminds me a little bit of Monsieur Lombard. There's There's some touches here that feel you know, similar. This is maybe a little bit more green, um, a little bit more spicy, if I remember properly. Um, this is maybe a touch more powdery. Even though this does go powdery, uh, that, that musk that kind of reminds me of Paul Sebastian's fine cologne is more amped up here. Now, powderiness was obviously a theme that started to take off in the 1960s. Um, Abbey Rouge is a powdery fragrance. And I really thought Abbey Rouge was almost like a trendsetter in the uh, masculine game because it reminds you of Shalimar, a masculine Shalimar. But Abbey Rouge actually came out after Monsieur Lambon. Um, Abbey Rouge, the original EDT, came out in 1965. Some say 66, some say 65, some say 64. Um, Monsieur Lambon came out in 63. It has vanilla in the base. Uh, and it's powdery. So my brain is kind of, you know... I had a little bit of a, of a knock across the head today and wearing this because I really enjoyed it. I had a feeling I was going to enjoy it after looking at the notes and all that stuff. Um, and when I saw there were no reviews, I said, oh, you know, this is going to be one of those fragrances that no one talks about that I'm going to absolutely love. And sure enough, here we are. Um, so the powderiness was obviously some sort of a trend. Canon is a powdery fragrance. If you've never smelled Canon, you have to smell this fragrance. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is one of those vintage fragrances that I would highly urge you to go try. Um, but I hear, you know, there are, there are people that sometimes talk about these things. They talk about, I hear, I rarely do I hear fragrances get like chaps get talked about, but it, but it is out there. I've never heard anyone talk about Monsieur Lambon. And probably because it's been discontinued for so long, I think when, um, so what ended up happening 
with this house, by the way, is, you know, they're a Paris house. They wanted to have distribution to the United States. And you might know a little distributor named Charles of the Ritz. Charles of the Ritz distributed Koros. Um, that was a big distributor of YSL fragrances and stuff like that. And so Charles of the Ritz and, and Lanvin joined forces. And um, that happened right around the time this fragrance came out. They also released, I think, maybe they released something like three or four other fragrances. I can't exactly remember how many they released, but I know they released something like three or four other fragrances um, at, at the time that Charles of the Ritz and Lanvin, you know, joined forces. Um, but this wasn't their first masculine fragrance, by the way. The first masculine fragrance was created in 1933. And it was called Eau de L'Enfant, and I think that was more of a cologne style. That was more of a Chanel, Pour Monsieur style, if you will. More of a cologne style. I think it translated to um, healthy water, is what that is what that basically meant. Um, and so Charles of the Ritz kind of helped get the distrib. Ah, here we go. Uh, so the other fragrances they released when they when they um, hooked up with. Um, when they hooked up with Charles of the Ritz is a fragrance called Figaro. And the advertisement is very interesting because, again, we're talking the 1960s, I believe. And it says, the beginnings of a new international habit. Okay, the beginnings of a new international habit. Now that habit rouge, habit rouge, that habit name I know it doesn't mean the same thing as in as French as Abbey Rouge. There, this is an English advertisement, but just that they use that name shows you the direct competition that all these companies were kind of swimming in this pool. Um, and Long Vaughn is a house that never gets talked about. I I own um, I own Avant Garde from 2010 or something, which I like, and I also own um, Arpege Porom which I like that fragrance, but it's a clearly a, a take on Dior Homme, almost a straight rip off. The cap even looks, you know, very similar to the Dior Homme cap. They tried to make it, you know, look similar kind of thing. Um, and so you can, but it does give you an idea of how these houses are kind of all competing and jockeying for position. But that being said, how does something like this just get lost, you know, in the shuffle, just completely forgot about? And it really makes you think, um, you know, it, it really makes you, it makes you think about uh, fragrances from the past and the world that they were competing in back then. We're looking at them from 2022. Things back then were completely different. The way that um, the, the way that the public perceived the fragrance. And so this is definitely a citrus um, fragrance at the top, you get the citruses because it's competing with other citrus fragrances, but this is so much more. And that's what I really love about it. Um, you know, it has that chiffre structure, that chiffre heart that I love so much. And there are some, um, you know, there are some aromatic touches to it, but it doesn't just go, um, you know, it doesn't just go citruses with some oak moss and some, some sandalwood like, um, you know, poor monsieur. It does more. It, um, the, the, the leathery labdanum, the uh, styrax, uh, the civet, that dirtiness. And, you know, it, it does have that green touch. And I can't really place the green touch because it's not galbanum, but it does have this greenness to it. Uh, I read a Fragrantica article where the person said, I think it was that Sergey Borisov guy who does his edit, he does his, you know, Fragrantica uh, columns from time to time. And he said that that greenness reminded him more of Miss Dior. Now, I have a sample of Miss Dior, but I haven't given it a full wear. I can't really say whether that's true or not. But, um, 
there there is some there there is some very interesting greenness mixed with the citruses um and then you get that floral heart with the spicy cinnamon the the heaviness of the labdanum and the base the leather the civet i love this fragrance uh, I would I would trade my bottle of Pour Monsieur for a bottle of uh, Monsieur L'Enfant right now. Just trade it. Just put put this in the screen and take this out. Um, but um, you know the thing about it is when you are a, a fragrance enthusiast and you're doing research and stuff like that, uh, how how would you know about this if no one's talking about it? How how would you even know it existed to put it on your potential to sniff list? There are literally zero YouTube videos on it, like I said. So, um, it's a lost gem to history. And I wonder, some part of me, you know, wonders how many of these fragrances are out there that, um, you know, you go to eBay right now and you take a look. And I think you can probably find bottles for, you know, whatever it is, 100, 200 bucks or something. So, the prices haven't gone insane because no one's talking about it. You know, it's the hype that really brings up the price, the the pricing. But these kind of gems are floating around out there. So um, I think that if you like fragrances like Canon, now I will tell you, Canon uh, leans more towards that floral jasmine, more towards the. There's a frankincense note here, which is very important, which is not present in the Monsieur Lambon. Um, and there's honey here, which is not present in Monsieur Lanvin. So there's some differences, but they really remind of one another. And then the musk in this um, in this Paul Sebastian Fine Cologne will remind you of the musks that are used in Monsieur Lanvin, which tells me, since both of these came after, this came a decade and a half after, this came a couple years after, that this was an influential fragrance. It wasn't just something that got released and got pushed aside. Houses paid attention to the trend. And so that makes it even more important in the, you know, timeline of fragrances and how fragrances are brought out and whether they make an impact. There are fragrances that are flops with the public, but they may make huge impacts in the actual community with the, you know, perfumers and with the houses, with the nose of the house and you know, the creative directors and stuff like that. And while I'm I'm sure this wasn't a flop because it wouldn't have lasted until 1990 when L'Oreal bought the rights to Lombon and nix this or whatever it was, 96, 1990, something like that. Um, it, it, it obviously uh, made some sort of a mark. It made some sort of an impression. So if you can get your nose on this, do so. I would highly, especially if you're somebody like me who enjoys the uh, fragrances of the past who, you know, if you're, if you're an old soul, you can tell you don't have to be an old man to like fragrances from, from the past. If you're an old soul and you have some gravitas about you, you have some experience about you, check out a fragrance like, um, uh, Mon Monsieur Lambon. I would probably have skipped this in the past thinking, oh, it's going to be another citrus heavy fragrance like these two, which I don't care for these. Even though these are all-time classics, they're not my favorite, personally. This is personal opinion speaking. Um, and so I probably would have skipped this, thinking, oh, it's the 1960s, it's probably going to be something similar. No, this is a, this is a league of its own. The, the only other fragrance from the 60s for men I can think of that I would put above this is Abbey Rouge. This cannot dethrone Abbey Rouge. Abbey Rouge is a masterpiece to me, and that's that. Uh, but this just instantly wiped all the other 1960s stuff off, off the map, in my opinion. Um, so that's an initial impression, but before we go, we have an unboxing and we have an unboxing of something that I have no idea what this is. This could be anything. I do know it's fragile, but other than that, I have no clue. There's no return address. There's nothing on here. So, um, let's see what it is, shall we? Let's open it up. See what we have. Unboxing night. I've been getting some work lately, eh? Okay, here we go. I guess I should have uh, 
done some of the hard work beforehand, maybe. What are you? Ah. Aha. Uh -huh. You are important. Okay, let's, let's pull you out. You guys ready for this? This is important stuff. Because these are Hermes fragrances. And anytime you get a new Hermes, it's a um, reason to celebrate. Okay, now, if you've been following my channel, or, you know, I jumped on a couple live streams with Eugene, and he was talking about this fragrance for the longest time. This is Rouge Hermes, and this is a newer bottle, you can tell. Well, there's actually no, I was going to say, where the, the, he took the uh, sticker off or whatever, so you can't really tell. Um, this is Rouge Hermes, and, um, well, I have no problem buying new bottles when it comes to Hermes, because they do good reformulations, and so I had a chance to get a vintage, I could have got a 30 ml vintage for the same price that I got this 100 ml bottle, so I decided, what the heck. I'll go for the new stuff. Eugene says that the new stuff is just as good, so if it's bad, we'll blame him. Uh, but he says that the new one is, is amazing, and, you know, Jean-Claude Elena did a lot of these reformulations. I have no problem with that. The other one, which actually does have a sticker on it, they didn't rip this one off, um, this is supposedly one of the greatest iris fragrances of all time. Uh, supposedly. This is... Hermes Hiris. This is supposedly a cold iris fragrance. Um, I love iris. I am a huge iris fan. Uh, this came out in 1999. And Hiris is amber, carnation, iris, and coriander with more iris, neroli, and rose, and then honey, almond tree, vanilla, and cedar. So, uh, a 1999 release. I love the artwork on the back. Is that the image you're supposed to get when you wear this? Um, and this one actually does have information on the bottom. And Rouge Hermes, I think came out a year after Harris. Rouge Hermes, 2000. Yeah, so this is 2000. Um, floral, spicy with iris, rose, ylang ylang, resin, sandalwood, vanilla, cedar, labdanum, and myrrh. This could have made my labdanum video. Um, but uh, very excited to try both of these. Uh, they are both targeted towards women, by the way. But they are both uh, so important. The House of Hermes is just such an important house that as a reference, you have to, you know, have these on your radar. And, you know, I did my old usual, hey, if I buy two, can I get a better deal? And it worked out this time. So, um, you know, very excited. You'll be hearing about these over the next weeks and months on my channel. And uh, it is May. So we will hopefully do a Muge video while May is Muge month, Lily of the Valley month. So I, I plan on honoring that, and uh, we'll have a we'll have a this is not a top ten Muge by the uh, by the end of the month. So thanks for watching my early impression, first impression on Monsieur Lanvin. Um, I can't believe it's a YouTube exclusive. I don't think I saw any other videos, but. Um, Hopefully I did it justice. I probably didn't, but at least it puts it on the radar for people to try to smell. Get a sample of this. Get your nose on it. I will be probably hunting a bottle if I can find one, you know, respectfully priced. Uh, and uh, it's definitely one if you're if you're if you have my taste. That's one to to that came out of the blue. Thank you, Mudasir, for sending that to me. Very kind of you. Thanks for watching, everyone. Keep it under thirty minutes today. So cheers, and I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye, guys.